Hey guys, this is my leak. This is the My Taught You podcast. I am here with my friend, Sean King. I'm really excited to talk to Sean today. We are going to cover everything you can possibly imagine. Sean is a writer, activist, serial entrepreneur, and he was a pastor at one point. And the way that I first even got to know Sean, Sean, this is before you didn't even know I existed at the time, but I was a huge fan of your church, which um, was Courageous Church, but everybody knew it as the Facebook church. And that is honestly the last church that I went to um, until you guys closed down because I just, I was blown away by how well you did it. But welcome, Sean. I'm so glad to be here. And and you know what? I did some background a long time ago and uh-huh. I searched my email for your name one time. Okay. And um, I saw that before... Uh, this was before Curlbox, <laughs> before I was writing for New York Daily News, before uh-huh. anybody knew anything about me or you doing what we do now. You sent me an email and you were just a visitor at Courageous Church and you mm-hmm. just sent an email just saying like, hey, I attended here today and really loved it. <gasps> and uh, and I was so, I, I mean, it, it was so cool because that was that was years ago. That was like maybe five or five years ago. And, oh, wow. um, and so you and I were in a very different place in life, but we, um, we were still the same people yes. substantively, but so much has changed since then. And when, when people find out that I was ever a pastor or your pastor, anybody, they're like, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I, are you talking about the police brutality guy? Yeah, and, uh, and people are surprised, and so I'm glad we can talk and just kind of lay it all out. This is the part that's so crazy is that like I remember my girlfriend Tony, who's been on the podcast, my book friend. She was telling me you, you got to go to this church. They have like free breakfast, and I'm like, Tony, are you serious? Like you you are serious about the free breakfast? She's like, No, it's good. And I remember going to the church, and I just I loved everything about it. It was so. It was so smart and so forward. And I remember thinking to myself, this guy is just ahead of his time. Like, I feel like you were so far ahead of your time that I I feel like now, you know, seeing you sort of be thrust into the headlines, I was just, I feel like you're just so misunderstood. Like, it's easy to be misunderstood when you're so far ahead of your time. Well, that is a a chronic problem of mine. And Mm -hmm. I think as I look back, like, over my life, even I'm, I just turned 37 a few days ago. I have oh. constantly jumped into something weeks or months or years before it was done a certain way, and mm-hmm. it's always ca- and it's always caused me to struggle out of out of the box. I I, I had an idea or a hunch or a feeling mm-hmm. that something should be done a certain way, and so I'll just go for it and. Courageous Church was like a dream, uh, uh, something that was in my heart for years to do, a, a church for people who really loved God but just hated all of the pretense and mm-hmm. all of the hoops and drama. And I, I didn't grow up in church, and so I, I was also thinking for people who, for various reasons— heard about Jesus and was like, wow, that that's cool. I like who this Jesus guy is. But then they look at Christians and they just kind of scratch their head. I tried to build a community that was for men and women who that made sense to. And, and Sunday service was not really our main thing, but it was just like, let's come together and make a difference in the world. And, um, I like that. That's what I remember. Like you had to do something like you, you were like, okay, these are the things that you can do this week. You had like the HIV ministry, like all these different things that people could do. Um, and I just thought that's what I think just moved me so much about what you were doing is that it was like, you have to, this is about service. This is not about sitting here on Sundays. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think for people who see what I do now and be it fighting police brutality or speaking out against racial injustice, and they look at me and they be like, wow, this guy came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But people who people who knew me in Atlanta, I moved to Atlanta in 1997 as a 
17 year old from Kentucky going to Morehouse and people who've known me since even before then, but certainly if you knew me from Atlanta, this is who I've always been. I've always been trying to figure out ways to make the world a better place. And, but what really gets me excited is helping other people make a difference in the world. Like I'm going to do what I do. Okay. What's always got me excited is figuring out ways to empower other people to to be the change in the world. And that's what Courageous Church was about. But that's what a lot of the things I've done over the years have been about. Got it. So would you consider yourself still religious? Do you still go to church? I, I'm in a I'm in a very similar place as you. You know, I, I moved from Atlanta to California. Mm-hmm. And um it was a pain like a painful time in my life. We closed down Courageous Church and my family moved from Atlanta to Southern California. And um, since then, I still believe in God. I still am deeply inspired by the courage of, of Jesus in the Bible that I see. But I'm not very religious. And um, I've dibbled dabbled. I've visited a few churches before. Uh, over the past few years, in part just because I wanted even wanted my kids to be a part of it. Okay. But I've but I've struggled with church over the past few years, and I think that's that's not a few of us. I think no. that's like the majority of us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I hear you. So I'm gonna get into. So when you start to research now, I remember when I started going to the church, I would see that you you had started a business. You were raising money for Haiti, I think, at yeah. the time, and you were so known. You know, you raised I guess millions of dollars on Twitter, but then it would be like one business after another after another. How many businesses do you like? How many businesses have you started? Wow. Well, across across the years from even since before Courageous Church all the way until now, I've probably started nine or 10 different projects or businesses or startups ranging from short term projects that were never designed to last. They were just designed to make a sudden impact, like be it raising money for uniforms for kids or toys for kids for Christmas or uh, or projects that I that I started like uh, an app that we launched called Upfront mm-hmm. where uh, I spent years out of not only out of the church world but even out of kind of the charity space working in uh, a, a, for a tech startup that me and two other guys built from scratch and um, so I, you know what I've always done is if when I have an idea, I almost feel like it's a dysfunction, but I mm-hmm. lack the, any, I lack no, <laughs> you know, like, I, yes, yeah. I, I was gonna, I was gonna yeah. let you, I'm letting you say this, yeah. but I'm like, well, Sean, sometimes I'm looking at you like, well, I can tell that somebody can call <laughs> you or you get a wild hair up there and it's like, Sean's, he's off. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm very, well, I am self-aware. Okay. But. I, and I saw I that. Not, I have not always been self. No, I saw that. You just celebrated your anniversary. Was it yesterday? Yeah, my wife and I, we've been married for 15 years. We've been together for 20. We've been together uh-huh. since we were in high school. And it, it's. It, I'm glad you brought that up because my wife, more than anybody else in the world, uh-huh. grounds me in reality. And slowly, I saw you say that on your post. You were like, thank you for putting up with my crazy. Yeah, well, I am, <laughs> you know, like I do... I don't have I don't have ADD. What I have is something almost the opposite of it. I get hyper focused. Mm-hmm. And when I see a problem in the world, okay. when I see something that I think could work and make a difference, I I get obsessive and okay. and whatever that may be at that phase of life, I'd go all in and yeah. um my struggle has not been getting great things started. Mm-hmm. My struggle has been after starting something and getting people wrapped into it and building momentum. My struggle has always been maintaining it. And I've been a first class starter 
but I've struggled to maintain the things that I've started over the years. Wow. And so I think, um, and so for the past two years, I have done something and stuck with it. Like every day, five days a week for uh-huh. two years, I write two articles a day. That's and awesome. So for two years, I've literally. So this has been two years for you. Wow. Yeah. So for two straight years, I've written now over a thousand articles, primarily about injustice in our country, about racial violence and police brutality. Do you think, but this is what I want to know. Did you consciously decide, like, I am not going to move? Like, have you, did you say that? Or do you think that this work, um, this work has kept you there? Like, what is it? Did you decide this or is have there been times where you're just like, I'm ready to do something else? Well, I'm always ready to do something else. Okay. Uh, like I have 10 different ideas <laughs> that I would swear to you. Mm-hmm. They're all going to work. They're mm-hmm. all amazing. Like you can't, and you can't tell me otherwise. I believe you, Sean. And, I mean, I... but, but, um, <laughs> I, the injustice in America mm-hmm. has bothered me deep down in my soul. And okay. um, I, I, about literally over two years ago, I was uh, I was living in California and mm-hmm. I was working for an environmental charity, uh, managing all of their communications. And that's like I do what I do, but I also have certain skills and certain training and background. And so I was working for this charity called Global Green, an amazing charity, international charity. Mm-hmm. And um, our offices were in Santa Monica, like right on the beach. And it was a really cushy, comfortable job. And uh, that was in July of 2014. And I got an email from a buddy of mine that... I had no idea at the time, but it changed the entire trajectory of my life. Mm-hmm. I've always been bothered by injustice and people who know me, I've, I've always been a part of protest. I've always spoken out on injustice, but more mm-hmm. as just a concerned citizen. So I got this email, Malik, and it, it, it impacted me in a way that I never could have imagined. My, my buddy said something to the effect of, Sean, there's this video on YouTube And there's this grown man being choked to death by police. And he Mm -hmm. says, you got to see, you got to see it. And here's how much things have changed. At the time, I didn't know if I clicked on it, like if it would even, we had filters, like safety filters on our computer. I didn't even know if it would come up because of the way he described it. And Mm -hmm. I was even, even when he sent it to me, I was like, damn, I don't don't even know if I want to see this. Right. And so I clicked on the link. And there was a there was a man and that man turned out to be Eric Garner. And I've since become friends with his daughter and his family. Okay. and he wasn't being choked to death. He was just chilling, talking to police, basically saying, please, please leave me alone. I'm not bothering you. Right. And before I know it, the thing that my friend described happened in there, choking this man to death. He's telling them he can't breathe. And I had the I had the thought then and there. I'd never seen anything like that. Mm-hmm. I protested police brutality before, but there had never been a video of it. And okay. Amadou Diallo was killed in New York. A brother named Sean Bell was killed. I'm, I'm living in New York now. There were no mm-hmm. videos of those. Right. And I had the thought at the time, and I, I turned out to be terribly wrong. Okay. I had the thought, if I show this to the world, there's going to be justice. Oh, okay. And that was my thought. And that was a sensible, reasonable conclusion. Mm-hmm, that sure. This is terrible. And at that time, I, I wasn't, I didn't have nearly the network that I have now, but I was a fairly well-known guy. Uh-huh. And, and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to share this video. And so for the next five or six days, I be, as I just described, I become obsessed Right. And I, I I literally taught myself how to edit videos and how to make still videos. And I was like, listen, I'm going to show this to my friends and family. Uh-huh. And I'm going to make this case known. And they're going to arrest this officer because this has to be against the law. And for about two weeks, 
to the point where I thought they were going to fire me at Global Green. I started doing a terrible job at Global Green. Because like, you're now obsessed with something else. Yeah, I'm obsessed with a new, this injustice that has gripped me. Uh-huh. And I am literally like dropping ball after ball at my nine to five and just writing obsessively about this Eric Garner case. And literally, while I was writing and talking about Eric Garner's case, somebody else, a friend of mine from St. Louis, wrote me about two weeks after that. And he said, ma'am, and here's how he described it. He said, listen, they killed a kid in this neighborhood named Mm -hmm. Ferguson. And he said that it's happening right now. He said, Sean, if you go to this link, the kid is just laying flat on the pavement. And they, and you know, at that time we didn't know what the true story was or what it was. I clicked on the link and there it was a kid laying flat, bleeding dead on the middle of the street. And that was Michael Brown. And that was Michael Brown. And then a few days later, I learned that police killed a young father in a Walmart named John Crawford. And um, then just about a month after all of that, um, I'm learning new cases. And then in November of that same year, um, something really impacted me. I'm a father with five kids. And they killed a boy named Tamir Rice. And all of this Mm -hmm. happened in my life and in in, in all of our lives in a span of just about six weeks. And um, the the stories and the things that I was just telling on my Facebook page and on my Twitter page had become so known and had gone viral that Daily Coast, a liberal news website, said, hey, would you come work for us? We don't even want you to do anything different. We just want you to keep writing what you're writing, how you're writing it, but just do it for us. Wow. And um, it was it was a blessing because I was doing such a terrible job for Global Green. Right. And, that you, yeah, and so you needed they, this out. Yeah, I needed I needed a way to do what I was doing. And Daily Coast provided that for me. And allows you to support your family yeah. while, do, while doing it. So I, I have a bunch of questions about this, yep. Sean. And so I think you've answered some of them. I wanted to know, how do you find out about this, the, these sort of injustices? Do people, are you on a list? Uh, is it like, how, how do people, is it social media? How are you finding out? Well, now is a little different than back then. Like now, okay. it's almost like a, there's this movie, um, Bruce Almighty, where Jim Carrey plays almost like plays God, where he can he hears everybody's concerns and issues, and and it's like almost overwhelming for him. Well, today my life is a is a lot like that in the sense that. On the average day, I get hundreds and hundreds of people to email me or Facebook me or even they find my number and text me about some injustice that their family is facing. And so, so, so the stuff you're sharing is is if you had to put it in like a percentage is like what percentage that you guys are putting out versus what's actually happening. Like, you know, it seems like weekly or monthly, we see some sort of, you know, some black person being killed. It's by far the more than that. It's, it's last year in 2015, mm-hmm. 1,207 people were killed by police. And so we're talking about more than three per day. Ugh. And, and so for instance, on my birthday, September mm-hmm. 17th, six people were killed by police on that day. And uh, one of those uh, was Terrence Crutcher, a uh, 40-year-old black man in Tulsa, Oklahoma, whose car broke down. And, and mm-hmm. as some of your listeners will know, um, the officer was just arrested for, for that. And so every day there is, and those are just, we're talking about people who are killed by police. Uh, every right, day, right. Every day, there are grave injustices all around our country, and and all of them aren't fatal. Some of them are just issues of racism or bigotry or discrimination, or people who have a violent encounter with police but don't die. And so every day, I'm inundated with 
so much that people are struggling with. And my job, what I do for a living now is try to put voice to those yeah. stories. And, um, and you've been doing a fantastic job, Sean. I mean, I know you catch a lot of grief, which I want to talk to you about, but I feel like I don't know how many people tell you this. I'm, I am certain that a lot of the things that I know about and the awareness has come from you. And I even was just looking on your Facebook page the other day and how it's like, when you say like, I think I saw your Facebook page. You were like, we're going to we're raising money for this family right now. And I saw that the post was like two hours ago. And I was just thinking to myself, like, you know, I don't know if he can, you know, is he really, is he really this guy? And I clicked it and it was like almost at the end. And I was just like, who are these people? How do you have this ability to just say, this is what we're doing. And everybody jumps on board. Like how, how do you get all these people to support and pay, um, considering the controversy, which we can get into, but why yeah. do you think people support you like so well, quickly? Well, the good, the good news about who I am is that I have a very long track record mm-hmm. of raising money and then that money doing exactly what I said it was going to do. And so well before I was raising money for these families who are affected by police brutality, I was raising money for kids in Atlanta, for Mm -hmm. families in Haiti, for uh, flood victims back in Atlanta when I lived there. And so I've been doing it. And I think there are a few things that, a few reasons why it works well. One is I've built an audience of people who are always looking for an opportunity to give to something that's Mm -hmm. going to actually impact real people. And so I, I have a big inside of my network is a pretty huge donor base of people who, when I ask, move very quickly. So we raised in 10 hours for Terrence Crutcher's family, like $125,000. Yeah. And, um, and that's, that only will give them a little bit of relief. They would, they would trade that money and, and 10 times that money to have their 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 son back, their father back. But I also I don't ask for money often, but when I do, it's for something that really matters. Mm-hmm. And um I I've caught hell for raising money in part because I am I have become known for raising it. And right. and it makes me a really easy target. And um I think it's pro if anything has probably hurt my feelings or broken my heart. It's the lies that people, all the stuff people say about my race, about my family. That's one thing, but it frustrates me to no end when I raise this money for families and people say he's stealing this money. He's raising it for himself or that's, that stuff bothers me more than anything else. I can imagine. I wondered this. I was like, I, based on if I if I had to try to add it up, you've raised millions and millions and millions of dollars. I probably raised I probably raised close to ten million dollars. Okay. Across the across the years. Across the years. And for the in this Black Lives Matter movement, uh-huh. I, I've I've helped raise at least a million dollars, maybe more. Okay. And in that million. I have not received a single penny, not a dime. I I have never expected to receive. And during that time, I I have my own employment. I work. My wife works. She's a school teacher. I That's would never want any of this money. Do and you get- is this do you get have you gotten rich doing this because i think that's what oh, people no, want to no. know i'm no, like no, if no, you, if no, you, no, if you work at the paper and, and, your, and your wife's a teacher i'm like i don't uh, nah like yeah not only not only are we not rich but like any young we have five kids like any young <laughs> family so there's seven of us and we live in a two-bedroom apartment in brooklyn Wow. And we we struggle month to month, like oh, most boy. New Yorkers do, to right. make it to make ends meet. And so, no, I've never been wealthy a day in my life, and I don't I don't despise anyone who is, okay. but I have not benefited 
ever, nor would I, off of any of the money that I've raised for families. And here's the beautiful thing. Every family that I've ever, and this is my payoff, every uh-huh. family who I've ever raised money for, including Terrence Crutcher's family, who are preparing to bury him this weekend, they have been immensely supportive of me continually through all of the drama because they know. And right. you will not find one person on earth who will ever say, Sean took a dime from me or Sean raised money for us and we did not get it. And and with all of this money that I've raised as a part of the Black Lives Matter movement, not only did I not receive any of it, it, it never even went to any accounts that I managed. It always went directly to a, to the family's bank or to their family's attorneys. Okay. I'm just the guy that's like, screaming and yelling trying to raise it. trying to raise it i know and you know what i like about you though sean is that you will get people together like you if people come for you you will have a medium post you will have a facebook post but something that you said that really moved me is that you said it's worth noting that george zimmerman and darren wilson raised over a million uh, dollars online with minimal effort and little scrutiny like you're doing all this work raising money for families and people people have picked you apart a bit um i saw this bro- i saw this brother yesterday the guy had thousands of followers and mm-hmm. he tweeted something to the effect of you all know sean king's stealing all this money he's raising oh wow and, and it had been it had been retweeted like a hundred times i'm just gonna and say was- this you not let me just I just want to let people know like just from a lifestyle perspective like you're not working at the paper and wife's a teacher like millions of dollars you wouldn't have to do that you could you could tweet all day. Well, here, well, not only not only that, but with the scrutiny that I am under, you could not steal from one family and get away right. with it. Like if anybody had ever been wronged or not received something it would be a legal scandal like it would okay that's a crime and that's so a crime. yeah and and so what i do do gladly and willingly is i am willing to take the hits and okay. and i'm willing to be that guy who folks say 20 different crazy things about <laughs> Right. If at the end of the day, the people I'm fighting for get the help that they need. And so I'm a bit it bothers me, but I'm as impervious to it as somebody can, because at the end of the day, I have the peace of mind of knowing like I help. Like, it's hard to help anybody right in this time that we're in. Like, there's so little justice that most of us feel like, damn, are we even making a difference? Right. And Which, I get the peace of mind of, at the end of the day of feeling like I've made some type of difference for these families. I want to ask you a question though, Sean, because I was, um, so I live in a neighborhood and I am the only black woman in my neighborhood. And my neighbors, uh, my neighbor invited me out to lunch last week. And I was wondering, like, I kind of wonder what it was about because I'm cool with my neighbors, but it's not like, you know, go to lunch. Cool. And so, uh, mid, at the start of the lunch, he was like, you know, I kind of I wanted to talk to you about Black Lives Matter. And just we started having this conversation about how he recognized that, you know, he was in this restaurant and he had this fear um, that came over him of like there were two big white football players. But then when this big black guy came in, like this fear and we, we had a conversation about that. And like, how does how do these things start? Where does fear come from? Um, but then at the end he was asking me, you know, what, what could he do? And that's why I said, you know what, this was literally yesterday. And I was like, I'm going to save this question for Sean. What can not, what can black people do? What can, like, what can we do? What can white people do? What do you think that we can do? Because besides giving money, uh, I think we, we, we start, we start to feel helpless. Yeah. I think a lot of people, I, I, I get I get, I get on an average day, like I get sometimes like a thousand, literally a thousand emails from Mm -hmm. ranging from people asking, what can I do to people Uh who are facing the injustice themselves? And probably the question I get asked the most is good people 
just wanting to know how can I impact this issue in mm-hmm. a way that matters. And so um, in July and August, I wrote for the New York Daily News a 25 part series I on, saw that. So- on solutions mm-hmm. for police brutality. They're very reasonable, achievable micro solutions and each of them individually would not fix the problem but when put together they could really move the meter and drastically reduce uh, police violence and police brutality and all of these murders of people that we see and um, there are a few ways that people can make a difference with those but they're all highly local right and um I think a lot but of for us, those, if, if someone doesn't, people are going to be in the car listening. What are, I know that there's 25. What are your top like three? Like, what are three things that you think people can do? Because I read through some of them and I know like they, they are, your solutions are so, sort of like um, having police have to have, you know, degrees, which I, I'm with you on that. But like for the sake of conversation, what, you know, what are some things that people can do? Well, I, I, I'll even take a step back. I think that. What I've, what I've come to learn and what I did not know two years ago is that the criminal justice system in America is incredibly complicated. It's the most complicated problem I've ever taken a, a deep dive into in, in my entire life. It's, there are 20,000 police departments in, in America. They each have a different staff, different oversight, different rules and regulations. A lot of them have their own unions. And the federal government has very little say in what those police departments do. And that's on purpose. Uh, Local rights activists and states rights activists have fought for since long before we were born to make sure that police departments operate very autonomously. And so here we are in 2016 trying to fix these problems. And we're used to the federal government being able to swoop in and Mm -hmm. fix things for us. And and what I want your your listeners to know is that if that could be done, President Obama would have done it. He cares, he sees the problem, but his hands were tied in a lot of ways because police departments are local and prosecutors are local. And so... What we're talking about doing now is developing here in the next, probably the next 60 to 90 days before the new year, a national boycott, a well-conceived, well-orchestrated boycott that comes with it, prescriptive solutions for police brutality, including things like body cameras and better training Okay. Uh, but but so much more than that as well, and so that people can feel like they are being heard and that we are putting real pressure on local politicians, local prosecutors, and local police departments to make these types of changes. And so I think our protests have done one thing really well. They have made the world aware of the injustices that we face. And two years ago, it was debatable whether or not the world really understood what black folk face on a daily basis. Now the world knows, Mm -hmm. but we have to pivot from awareness because now we're aware to the point of it's traumatizing all of us. Yes. So now we need to pivot somehow from awareness to change. And I say that in that way because the Montgomery bus boycott happened in 1955 and 1956 in Montgomery, Alabama, but they did not see the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act for 10 more years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we are right now, Malik, is that we are probably two years in to a 10 year fight. I think I saw you said that. You saw that recent, you said that like, this is, we're just getting started. And so when it comes down to sort of like, what can we do? 
I love the 25 points that you have. And I think it is just like this awareness. And what are your thoughts? Like when people start to say all lives matter, like, do you, that, that cooks some people's grits. How does that make you feel? Well, all, all lives do matter to me. Mm -hmm. Right. And all lives matter to you. And, Mm -hmm. and all lives matter, particularly to black folk. Right. When, when we say, and we feel the need to say black lives matter, It's because when we look at police brutality in America, when we look at racial violence, when we look at economic inequality, even when we look at at things on a different level, be it equal pay for equal work, what Mm -hmm. we see is that black folk are consistently given the short end of the stick. And so when we say black lives matter, it is in response to all the things that happen in this country and in this world that try to convince us that black lives don't matter. And and when we look at what happened to Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a man whose car is broken down, whose hands are in the air, who shot and killed and then completely ignored while he was still living by five different police officers who didn't even check his pulse, who gave him (sighs) no comfort. It's hard for me to believe that black lives mattered to those white men and women who killed him and ignored him while he was fighting to survive. And so when we say black lives matter, it is in response to injustice, to inequality, to to discrimination and racism. It's of course, all lives do matter theoretically. Right. But in the world that we live in, that's not our reality. And so we're forced to uh, to give words and voice to our pain. And so we say black lives matter because the world often acts like they don't. Right. Now, Sean, before I get into and I told you how this podcast goes, uh, you and I talk about some things and then we get into some listener questions. But before I get into your book, which I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk about why do you think I saw there was all this drama. I remember that happened about whether or not you were black and like, is he the, I don't know what the dole is all girl is, but is he that like, why do you, why do you think people care so much about that? And how much does that bother you? You know, well, cause I, you were like, my mother's a senior citizen. And I, I, I imagine that had to be tough. Yeah. So, for, so first off, I, Rachel Dolezal bothers me. (laughs) And I think she is who she is and she she has to live her life and she has to pay the price and the consequences for the decisions she made. Mm -hmm. But Rachel Dolezal, my understanding is that when she was around 30, began to pivot and pretend like she was somebody that she's not. Right. She sued Howard University for discriminating against her as a white woman, that she filed a lawsuit saying that this black college mistreated her as a white woman. And so she lived a fully white life. She is a, she is a white woman. And in a lot of ways, she is kind of in a complicated form of blackface. And, mm-hmm. and so when it became, and I didn't know her before the scandal, but some people did. And, She was actually doing some decent work in Spokane, Washington. And when it turned out that people found out that this was a woman, I don't know if she's doing like spray tan or, you know, wearing, you know, wigs and weaves and these types of, and when people found it out, it was so crazy and so weird and surprising and juicy that it became a conversation like, mm-hmm. is anybody else doing that? Right. And at that same time that all of this foolishness unfolded with her, I was already doing what I'm doing now, talking about police brutality and injustice. And when people started saying, maybe Sean King is Rachel Dolezal. Right. This was before it blew up. Okay. I saw that. And I had the thought, Uh-oh. This is, well, no, my first thought was, this isn't going to go, this, this is not going to go anywhere. Oh. Because 
I, at that time, I'm I'm a 35 year old man. Mm-hmm. Anybody who's known me my entire life knows there is never a point in my whole life where I have been a white man and then pivoted to being multiracial okay. or a black man. Like that's not who I am. Like in at all the way back to elementary school, mm-hmm. you will find people who say, yes, I know Sean. And even in my small rural town, people who know the mm-hmm. black members of my family. And okay. so I grew up in I grew up in rural Kentucky in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And my my mother, who I'm very close with to this day, mm-hmm. I, I, I love my mother a great deal. Before I was ever born, okay. my mother in the 70s had a relationship with a black man in Versailles, Kentucky. My mother's a, uh, at the time was a, a young white woman in rural Kentucky. Okay. And I, obviously I had nothing to do with that relationship and I'm, I, wasn't, I wasn't even born. Right. And so um, when I was born, my mother had gotten married. And uh, and then when I was a young child, she got divorced to the man that I believed at that time was my father. I didn't I didn't know, but they got divorced when I was three or four. He was a white man. So but because I know that this was on your birth certificate. So she already had you when she got married or was she pregnant? No, she, was, like... she, was, she was pregnant when she got married. OK. And um, and like my wife was pregnant when we got married. Like that happens. And, you but, know, by, like, but by you, I mean, uh, right. I mean, not but, y'all be, but I don't, but here's the guy, thing. did your father at the time think that this was like, I hate to be like scandal, but you know, or you don't know. Well, no, no. At, at, at that time, I, it's, it is my, you know, first again, I want to, to go back. I had nothing to do with that. Right. And, and, and obviously that's common sense. Right. But there is a, there is this thing as if people are holding me accountable. Right. For decisions that I did not make. This is true. And yeah. and so. And not fair to you. And the thing that I was like, this is such a bummer, but it's almost the choice that we make when we choose to be public is that everything is now sure. up for discussion. Yeah. And you so know what I mean, yeah. And so for the first five or six years of my life mm-hmm. and I, I actually have I wrote an entire book about my life with race that's coming out next year and um, you wow so so white families don't talk about race and they don't talk they don't talk about being white they don't talk about whiteness they don't race and racial matters mm-hmm. by and large aren't talked about at white dinner tables. And so young white children have very low racial IQs. And my mother and in my house, my my sweet white mother, we never talked about race. And I did not know what it meant to be biracial. I understood that there were people who looked different than me. I did not even know, I I didn't know even that I was white. We just didn't even talk about it. And so, but I believe, if anything, I believed myself to be just like my mother and and my mother who was white. So did she ever tell you this or did you guess like, and I'm not, and I hear you, Sean, and I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be a mess. I'm not. No, 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 no. no. So let me, because I don't, because I was raised in a black family. And so I know at some point, at some point, someone made you aware, like whether or not it was discussed at home, somebody told you. So. When I was in, so I was in second grade and by, by that time there were things about me mm-hmm. that stood out to people that I did not know stood out to people. Like I, okay. I, I again, I was seven and I was just myself. Right. right and right. so in second grade, I have a whole chapter about this and I know these mm-hmm. girls to this very day uh-huh. in second grade, I'm in the lunch line. Mm-hmm. at Huntertown Elementary School in Versailles, Kentucky. And two girls come up to me, two giggly girls, and they ask me, are you mixed? Wow. And, and I, so again, white people don't talk, up, 
that word mixed meant nothing to me. Like okay. now my kids and other people's like black families talk about race. Okay. And so in my house, so when they asked me if I was mixed, I swear to you, like I, I've always been like kind of cool. And so I tried uh-huh. to play it off, <laughs> but I had, <laughs> I had no idea what they were talking about. Okay. And I remember thinking like, like I literally thought they were asking me if I was confused or if I was mixed up or like I didn't even know what they meant. You didn't know what they meant. Didn't know what it meant. But immediately I had I had the awareness that like, oh that that's strange. That's very peculiar. Yeah. Well by the so- by the end of that year, by the end of my second grade year, I on this kind of journey of child, adolescent self exploration learned that being mixed would mean that my mother had been with a man other than the man I thought was my father. Right. And and so here's what happened. I, I, I like worshiped the ground my mother walked on sure. and I knew even in my like young, innocent mind that if I was mixed, that that meant something really weird had happened to me with my mother. Like I, I began viewing myself even mm-hmm. as a bit of a scandal. Uh, like, yeah, I, I began, and and what it did to me, that's deep. It caused me to begin living one life in my house. And then a very radically different life outside of my house. By the time I was in third and fourth grade, people began, and it's again, it's a small town and folk talk. Yeah. People began not just asking me if I was mixed, but people began saying things like, I know, I know your, I know your father, or yeah. I am, I am your uncle. Did like, you, and did you ever take any of these things back to your mom? Like, did you ever say, uh, as a kid, it wasn't until so I I got into a point where I compartmentalized it mm-hmm. so much mm-hmm. that it was it became a pathology mm-hmm. that I refused to talk with my mother about as a young child. Okay, uh, like as an elementary school child. Okay, and I just wouldn't wouldn't talk about it. Like I. In part, I didn't even fully even understand like what sex and other things were. Like I didn't even. What about your siblings? Because I I would think that your siblings would know, would say something. No. Well, my, I, my, my older brother and I, we always knew that we had different dads. My mother, my my mother had been married a few times. Okay. And so my brother is like, he and I have always looked very different. And and so it wasn't like, hey, Sean looks a lot different than me. He and I always had looked so different. Okay. And now it does get in. My mother's never going to listen to this podcast, but, you know, um, my brother also did not have a relationship with his father. Okay. And so, like, it was a thing in our family where we just didn't know our dads. All and, right. and it was like they weren't around. They weren't. And it wasn't even like there was a hole there. It was just our weird reality, our like yeah. a greatly dysfunctional reality that to like to this day, uh-huh. I have never talked with my brother about who his father is. That is so, I mean, never like and my brother and I are close. My brother and I are close. But I believe it, Sean. Listen, it's just like sometimes, I mean, I have mentioned ad nauseum that I have gone to therapy and I think because I they always say like the sickness is in the secret and it's just like there are so many families and so many secrets and so many people who to this day like you said, here you are. You just turned 37. And you still haven't had the conversation. So I guess it's sort of in every family has a different dynamic. So if this is how you guys well, did it, you why know, would you I've start now? To, yeah, I've come to, I mean, I've come to understand that there are hundreds of thousands of us who don't know yes, our fathers. Absolutely. And so, but the older I got, mm-hmm. uh, and by older, I mean like fifth grade, sixth grade, mm-hmm. by that time I have fully, like I've fully accepted myself as black. Like I wasn't even 
Okay. Like, by then I knew what race was. By right. then I'd already had people say like, this man over here is your dad. As okay. a as a prideful preteen, I didn't want any, I wasn't like dying to meet this man. I didn't want, there was a part of me that was bitter and like yep. didn't even want like, you know, like, nah, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine all by myself. Uh-huh. And, and so I just, I just lived my life of like, yeah, you know, when, before I was born, my mother did, like, I knew this in my mind. My mother had been with somebody else and uh, I had enough people tell me people who knew my mother before I was mm-hmm. born, who knew, who knew my biological father before I was born, who knew that, who knew that they were in a relationship and all that to feel like, okay. And part of me just felt like it was loving, whether it's true or not, mm-hmm. I felt like it was, it, it showed my love for my mother to just leave her alone about it. Okay. And, that's fair. And, and so to this day, have you not oh, ever... So, so, no, so my mother and I, in in high school, we talked some about it. In college, okay. we talked some about it. But very deeply uncomfortable. Yeah. And and it was just like my private, like, my private messy life. And it, was. it was. Yeah, it was just like... my So my wife, who I've been with since I was 15... Yeah, she's been through all like before I was like she knew all of this like she had talked with my mother about it Uh, okay like in when we were at Morehouse and Spelman we talked about it with my mother with other people like and then because it's a small town I always had people say like as weird as it is like you know I'm your cousin right or like even even last year when all this went down Somebody reached out and said, I, I'm, I know you don't know me, but I'm your aunt and this, that. And, have, and, you pers- have you pursued any of those people? Do you want to meet that side of your family? Or are you just like, I'm good? Have you met anybody? Well, I've actually, because the town is so small, I've yeah. met a lot of them. Like, oh, wow. Uh, okay. But I don't, my mother no longer lives there. And okay. um, she lived there into my adulthood. But before she moved out, before all of this drama went down. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I don't feel like there's a hole there okay. because there was never anything there. And um, wow. so it's not like there was someone there and now they're not there. It's it's all there's I've never had this other side of my family. And so. When people began saying, like, Sean is Rachel Dolezal, because I'm not Rachel Dolezal, yeah. I had the thought, like, well, that's not going to develop into anything. Okay. And, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it did. And it blew, I mean, yeah. like, it became literally the top trending topic oh, I know. in the world. And I... uh, it's like, which blows my mind. I know. And I was just thinking like, not to, not to hate on you, but I was like, that many people care about Sean King. Right, <laughs> right, like, right, right. <laughs> like that many people, I didn't even, I mean, I know you as like courageous pastor. I know you as 100 life goals. I know you've written books. I know you write, but I was like, dang, that's a lot of people caring. Well, I think, you know, by that time I had become such a visible yeah. face that the scandal was, what if the guy who is a visible face for the Black or, Lives Matter movement, mm-hmm. what if he's a fraud or a phony? What if he's, what if he is Rachel Dolezal as well? And if that was true, that would be crazy. Yeah, but, it would be. But people began treating it like it was true. Without even. Without, without doing any of the research, you know? And yeah. And I just... Think, there was just a part of me that felt like bef- as it began to blow up and then spiral out of control mm-hmm. before it got completely out of control. I felt like I can keep my story and my mother's business to myself. Mm-hmm. And as that it was, got, as it blew up, was, I realized I had to, I had to tell my story. And that was very naive of you, I think. You know what I mean? Because as much as you can probably find, people can do the same. It's insane. But I guess it's like now you know. You know what I mean? 
I know, but that's just, that's just what I know about being in PR for this long is that people will find it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, particularly in today's Yeah. Culture, they're going to get it. Yeah. People. And it, it, well, it wasn't that I didn't think like my thought was there is no scandal there. Okay. And so my thought was, I'm not, uh, why, why am I going to, why am I going to come out and talk? Like this was, yeah, my naive thought at the time was like, why am I going to come out and talk about it? Like, right. There's nothing there. There's like, nothing there. There right. is nobody on earth who is going to say, I remember Sean when he was white. And I remember when he began being right. Black. When like, he decided his freshman year that when he got to Morehouse, he was uh, going to put his do rag on. Because, yeah, because I, yeah, no, you never, you're never going to find that. Like right. people have known me my whole life, and and yeah. so, and and anybody who puts out anything otherwise, it's just fictitious. And so, I think the complicated part of it, though, Malik, is that physically, biologically, I'm not black. Like, I am a very white guy, right? Yeah. You know, like... Yeah. And but, you, but this is the thing, though, but I still feel... And I've seen you. I never, like... You are very pale. Like, right, you are right. very, very well, see, pale. And, and what people don't understand is, like, I am a black pale in the sense you, that... Exactly. I have a girlfriend who is pale, a pale black woman, but I have met you and I saw you I have never looked at you in person and thought Sean might be white not even with the haircut not even with the haircut like and here's the thing I have never and see here's the thing when you were at Courageous Church before Mm -hmm. I was like there was no there was no scandal then and and here's also the thing I have never done anything to look a certain way like If anything, I could I could try a little harder. You know, <laughs> you know? like right. if anything, I could work a little harder and get your and, right. Yeah, and, and and get my game right. You know, but I don't. That's not. I've never. That's not you I'm not playing a role. Like yeah, and, and, I believe you, Sean. Yeah, so, I know. Like that's like I see people like there are blogs saying that I that I put on makeup. There are, oh God! There are no. Blog, listen, there are blogs saying that my hair is actually red and that I dye it black. Oh, I, I did see that. <laughs> and it's like, no, I, I, of course I don't have. Like, I have never dyed my hair. I have never, I've never doctored my parents. Like, yeah. I am such, and you know me offline to know. Like, I am such a regular dude. Yeah, that I would never. Like, I'm not into that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right, and right, so no. I and, get it. And um. But I get it. I don't want to spend, I'm over. I don't want to talk about that anymore, Sean. I'm done with that. Forget these people. I want to talk about the power of a hundred. I want to talk about your book because I want to get to these listener questions. And so we're no more energy to that. What I think, what I dig most about you, Sean, is just how like dope you are and how much you kill it. And like, for those of you who haven't read Sean's book, the power of 100, Sean, you sent a lot of followers my way when you did the 100 life goals. Yeah. And when I read, I read the forward of your book and it's, and I'm going to read it. It's by Dale Partridge. It says, for some reason, we avoid thinking about death. It's as if we truly believe it will never occur to us. It's almost delusional. But as I grow older, I gain more clarity on the human condition. I realize life is more than a series of chaotic events slammed together. It's more than time passing and experiences had, and it's more than fading away at an old age. And so I really just I love the way the book opened and started up. But then um, there was there was a page that hit me really in the beginning. And you talk about people having a plan. And I think that that's what's so cool about you. Like you said, you're a phenomenal starter. And I, I imagine that you're a phenomenal starter because you probably always have a plan. And you say the truth is with a plan, you could have a Ph.D. in 10 years. You could you could be a doctor in seven years. You could be a lawyer in three. You could be a millionaire and purchase your own home with cash. Um and you talk about people, this mindset that people need. And I highlighted this and I want to talk about this on 18. You said, when you are prepared to see opportunities, your luck changes drastically. Yeah. You, be, you become a factory of good luck. And people start to wonder why good things are always happening to you. It's all in how you see things. And so 
Damn, I, I forgot that I wrote that. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. I'm reading that, I'm like, man, that is that is smart. Whoever wrote that is very smart. <laughs> and it's you. Yeah. It's you. And but, so you you go on and you tell people how to have a plan and you say, and I want to talk to you about your plan, but you say, um, I'm hungry. So people say, I'm hungry. You're like, I'm hungry is not a plan. And then they go, well, I need to go to the grocery store. And that's still not a plan. You say, here's a plan. This morning from 8 to 9 a.m., I'm going to make a grocery list of what I need. Well, then I'm going to go grocery shopping this afternoon and spend $300 on groceries from that list at Costco and Whole Foods. I'll eat lunch at 11, at Whole Foods before I shop and have a budget of 15 for my lunch. Like, much more specific than a general idea. So I, I think people always ask me how, and I just love how this book breaks things down yeah you know because it, what i what i grew to understand is that everybody has so many dreams so many hopes the life can even squeeze those things out of you yeah but that most of us get stuck at that dream and hope stage or we just stop dreaming and hoping all together and we uh -huh. never we never even kick into like second or third gear and what I what I came to understand about myself and the reason I wrote the book in the first place, before, I wrote the book before the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement even emerged. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I really almost kind of shelved the book in a sense because I had started fighting injustice where it almost became peculiar for me to talk about like setting and pursuing your goals. I found like the lessons that I teach in that book are very relevant for me even today that mm -hmm. whatever it is that you are wanting to do in the world, you, you, you have to really, you have to plan it out. You have to give yourself a deadline. You have to, and you have to do things to put pressure on yourself to actually follow through with those things that you, that you want to do with yourself. And I think th there are a few things that I heard consistently over my years as a pastor and as a leader. And it was people who always told me they regret it when they were in their twenties or thirties or forties or fifties, they regret it that they didn't do this, mm. whatever it was. And, and even then when I would tell them, I would be like, well, you can still do that. Like, I, I would meet somebody who was in their 40s and they would say, I, I, I regret that I didn't become a lawyer. I was like, well, you still could. Like, you can. <laughs> right, right. And But that's not how people see their lives because they feel like I'm on, I'm on a certain path, I'm stuck on this path, and I can't get off of this path. Mm -hmm. And what I've tried to model for people is that uh, in my own chaotic way is that if there's something that you are truly and genuinely passionate about, even if it doesn't quite line up with what you've done over the past few weeks or months or years, you can still go after it. You can still make it happen, you know? Mm hmm. I love that. And so for those of you who didn't know that Sean wrote a fantastic book and you're writing another one, uh, check out The Power of 100. It's a super it's a it's a um, relatable read. It's easy to read. Um, and I don't think you go over anybody's heads on this. Like you really make it uh, super bite sized. But Sean, this is the part where I ask you some my taught you listener questions. So we're going to say hi, Sean. At any point in your life, have you ever felt consumed or paralyzed by fear? If so, how did you manage it and move on? Yeah. Yeah. A fear is very real for me. Um, I, I regularly face it and, and deal with it. Like I choose not to make small, not to allow small fears to grip me. And I put myself in positions where the pressure to push past it is very serious. Like, like let me give you an example. Um, I really think this boycott idea that's on my mind could get some things done, and, and I want to do it. And so I wrote a story about how we need to boycott cities and places that 
don't address police brutality. I wrote mm-hmm. that yesterday. Well, privately, I wrote it because I knew once I put it out there, mm-hmm. it would put a real healthy sense of pressure on me to do something about it. And, yeah. and, and so one thing I say in the book, part of overcoming your fears is mm-hmm. getting your ideas out of your head because m- most of the time we talk ourselves out of our best life more than other people talk us out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, appreciate that. Okay. This is the next question. Uh, I'm a writer with published work. A supporter of mine working on a book emailed me to ask if I could contribute quotes to their book. As nice as it sounds, I don't know this person beyond the email that they sent, and I can't see how this would benefit me. Should I decline or help them out? It's okay to tell people no. And I I tell people no all the time, but I tell it to them with grace and love. And it's probably just a matter of telling somebody like, listen, I don't think that's for me. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and being okay with it and, and, and moving on. Like if you really don't feel like most people wouldn't even want a book endorsement from somebody if they weren't going to really mean it anyway. Right. And uh, so I wouldn't overthink it. If you okay. really didn't want to do it, I would just, I would just say no, but say it with love and grace and move on. Awesome. Okay. And this is the last listener question. We always do three. Um, I'm starting a business while working full time. I've been getting a lot of business on word of mouth and recently was late delivering a product to a client. She expressed she was upset. I apologize. I apologize as professionally as possible and expedited her product, but I can't stop beating myself up. Help. Mm, mm. That's a bad spot to be in. I, I, <laughs> I've been I've been in spots like that. Um, yeah. The. This is way easier said than done, but it's it's so worth it, my leak, is that if you if you've dropped the ball or if you've overpromised and underdelivered, you have to keep it real with people. Like yeah. to the point of profusely apologizing if it means you have to give them their money back and mm-hmm. And if it means, first off, it would be good if you could talk to these people face to face and so they could see the sincerity in your eyes and just say, listen, with whatever business opportunity is like, hey, I, I'm sorry, I've not been able to, to deliver and I may not be able to deliver. But the lesson in that is to not let that be a habit. You know, not to not consistently yeah. over promise and under deliver for people because it, it, it will it will ruin your business. It will ruin your reputation. It yep. will it will put you in a position where um, you could even be in legal trouble and, yeah. and people could sue you for uh, for not delivering on, on what you've committed to do. And so it, the key is. Don't allow multiple fires like that to develop because once it gets out of hand, mm-hmm. it'll just spiral out of control. And I hate telling people bad news. Like I, it's a problem that I have. Like I just hate being that guy. A lot of people do. But when you're an entrepreneur, it's uh, part of the yeah. It's part of the game. It's in the fine print. Yeah. I usually what I always say to people when you. First things first, nobody's perfect and you're going to mess up and people are going to get upset with you. So just that's a part of it. But I think that the moment that you realize, like, I I cannot stand when people tell me that they're late right at the time that they're late. So right at, if we're supposed to meet at two and you call me at two and say you're late because you knew you were late 30 minutes ago. Right, right. So I always say to people, when you know that you're falling behind on a deadline, the minute you know tell people right and just apologize then because that softens the blow it's like hey sheila i know that i said i would have this to you by friday if you tell sheila on wednesday that she's gonna have to wait a couple days she's gonna feel better than waiting until friday passes and it hasn't hasn't come in so as, as soon as you know you're late tell people and then like you said try to figure out ways to give people more value. If you are behind since I'm running late, I just, you know, because I'm turning this into you late, I did three extra things, you know, like I'm going to take advantage of this extra time and give people more because they feel better about it. But I do agree with you is that 
if you don't handle it early, people are not going to be feeling you. Yeah, no, not at all. So, yeah. Well, I'm so glad That's, that we got a chance to me too. chop it up. And... Yes. Thank you so, so much, Sean, for chatting with me. And you have happy belated birthday, happy belated anniversary. Good luck uh, with everything you're doing. Keep me posted on any way that we can help. Is there any particular destination that we can go to find and or help you? You know, I, I, I don't know why, but I've pivoted back to Facebook. Like I, <laughs> I, I now put a lot of effort and energy there and I post all of my articles and stories. There. Okay. So on every social network, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I'm backslash Sean King, S-H-A-U-N-K-I-N-G. And so people can find me there. But um, and and on Facebook, people can see I'm I'm starting to go some places and speak some places. So if people ever want to connect with me face to face, they can see me out and about. And all those events are on my Facebook page. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Take care. Bye.